Marines who went out to Colorado is that they came back hungering for more. They all had bought a book called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, and they want to read it together. So Mike and I and Jacob Crosby are joining them and maybe a couple other kids. And, and uh, so I had to order a couple copies. And when I did, one of the places I looked said recommended age, 22 and up. It's written for college graduates. And these guys are going into their senior year, but they're going to tackle it because they want to learn, they want to grow. So I'm really proud of these kids and what they've done and what they're doing. And, and I'm anticipating God using them in his kingdom in a mighty way. So thanks for your part in making that happen. The Bible says you'll reap what you sow. In fact, it says you'll always reap what you sow. If you plant tomatoes, hi, Bob. If you plant tomatoes, you don't get onions, right? Ever. Not ever. Somebody could play a trick on you, but the seed is going to be what it is. And so we make choices, and they make us. The, that's true for an individual, and it's true for a nation. And uh, God had a purpose for making us. He had a purpose for our unique life and for our unique nation. He certainly did for Israel. He had a special role for them, and he wanted them to know it, and he wanted them to know that it mattered. They needed to take that seriously. And so just before they entered the promised land, Moses said this, The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. They were called to have a connection with God that other people didn't have to to relate to God in a way other people didn't know how. That, that meant they would experience unique blessings. But it also meant that they had a responsibility. And so Moses went on to add, therefore, take care to follow the commands, decrees, and laws that I'm giving you today. Pay attention. Oh man, I can't tell you how many verses say that. How many verses talk about that? the importance, the necessity of obeying God. But it's there. And a few weeks ago, we looked at some verses in the Bible that began with the word if. Because some of what God says to us is conditional. If, if you do this, then this will happen. But if, if you do that, then this will happen. And we have to understand that we're sowing and we're reaping. If we do what God says, there's blessings. If we don't, there's a way that we lose out. And so he, preci he precisely laid out for them what it meant to be the people of God. And I want you to listen to a summary as we go back to Deuteronomy where Moses is setting them up. Moses did something for them that I don't know that's been done any time in history. He told them on the day that they were going to go into Israel, the land of Israel, become the nation there that God had designed, he told them ahead of time, not the day, but in the early days before that, he told them what their future would be. And he let them know that they had a choice of futures. And so listen to this summary from the book of Deuteronomy. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. But if you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and do not obey all the commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come and overwhelm you. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your towns and your fields will be cursed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be cursed. Your children and your crops will be cursed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be cursed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be cursed. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They will attack you from one direction, 
but they will scatter from you in seven. The Lord will cause you to be defeated by your enemies. You will attack your enemies from one direction, but you will scatter from them in seven. You will be an object of horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. Then all the nations of the world will see that you are a people claimed by the Lord and they will stand in awe of you. If you listen to these commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today, and if you carefully obey them, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you will always be on top and never at the bottom. The Lord himself will send on you curses, confusion, and frustration in everything you do, until at last you are completely destroyed for doing evil and abandoning me. The skies above will be as unyielding as bronze, and the earth beneath will be as hard as iron. You will become an object of horror, ridicule, and mockery among all the nations to which the Lord sends you. The foreigners living among you will become stronger and stronger, while you become weaker and weaker. They will lend, you, lend money to you, but you will not lend to them. They will be the head, and you will be the tail. Today, Today I have, have given you the choice between life and death, between, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. This command I am giving you today is not too difficult for you, and it is not beyond your reach. No, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart so that you can obey it. It is not kept in heaven so distant that you must ask, who will go up to heaven and bring it down so we can hear it and obey? It is not kept beyond the sea so far away that you must ask, who will cross the sea to bring it to us so we can hear it and obey? These instructions are not empty words. They are your life. By obeying them, you will enjoy a long life in the land you will occupy when you cross the Jordan River. You, you must, must not turn, turn away, away from, from any, any of the commands, commands I am giving you today, today nor, nor follow, follow after other gods and, and worship them. them. Serve, Serve only the Lord your God, God and, and fear him alone. alone. Obey his commands, listen to his voice, and, and cling to him. Well, which choice would you make? Well, we always do, don't we? We make those choices. We make them on a regular basis, whether we're going to listen or not. And God told these people, this is how important this is. You must obey. And as it says up here, he repeats it over and over and over again. And so they knew in detail what kind of blessings they could expect and what kind of disasters would come if they made the appropriate choice. God put it in writing so that they would have it in front of them, so that they could read it, so that they could pass it on to the next generation and the one after that. And he told them to read it as a, as a nation, every so often, to read it together. They could show other nations what it was like to follow God so they would want to. They were to, to be one of these. They were to be a lighthouse so that other nations would look at Israel and say, wow, look at what happens in that country. Look at how God has blessed those people. Look at how smart they are to live the way they live. And they would choose to be what God made them to be to follow the Lord God of heaven and not some vain idol. They were meant to have an impact in the world. They were meant to have an impact on the future generations. They needed to know that the choices they made matter. And the choices we make matter, don't they? They matter. 
As Christians, we have the same privilege and responsibility that they had. We're a lighthouse. People look to us. They see the difference Jesus makes in our lives, and hopefully they're attracted. Sometimes people will walk up to a Christian and say, I want to have what you have. It's a beautiful thing. It's what God means. But if we turn away from God or we just don't live up to his calling, uh, they may think that's not important. It's not even important to them. And so uh, they'll miss it. Israel paid attention at first. During the time of Moses, they mostly obeyed God. During the time of his follower, uh, Joshua, they mostly obeyed. But then look at this scripture. The Israelites served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the leaders who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They abandoned the Lord. They chased after other gods, and they angered the Lord. It comes from the book of Judges. The book of Judges is a is a book of a yo-yo relationship between God and his people. Sometimes they're close, sometimes they're rebellious. And what would happen is they would serve God for a while and they would be blessed. And then people would think, well, we can just make our own choices. And they'd go their own way and they would sin against God. And God would allow them to be conquered by another nation in their area, another country that was hostile. And they would be abused and they would be robbed and they would cry out to God and say, help us, we'll follow you. And then they'd come back, but it never lasted. In fact, the key verse in Judges, the one that's repeated a couple times, says this, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And whenever you have a group, a nation, a person who says, I'm just going to do what I think is right, they're going to miss out. Because we need to know what God says is right. And you'll see in the Bible often, for instance, John the Baptist's parents, it says they were good in the eyes of God. That's what counts, being good in the eyes of God, being the people he made us to be. And we can do the same thing they did. We can waver. We can fall away. You know, temptations appeal to us, don't they? Sometimes we know we'll be sorry and we do it anyway. You ever eat too much? You ever stay up too late? You ever go somewhere and you wish you hadn't? Or didn't go and wished you had? It's human nature. We, we can predict the consequence and yet we, sometimes we're trapped. Sometimes it's a lack of discipline. Sometimes it's just that we're willful. This is what I want to do. Don't ask Lita about her husband, okay? Our choices shape our future. They shape our life. They shape and determine our destiny. You are where you are in life right now because of the choices that you've made. And where you'll be in five years or ten years will be determined by what choices you make in that time. Now things can happen. Somebody can run into us in a car and change our life. But most of the things about us are a result of our own choices. And God wants to guide our choices. And you're never at a place where you're trapped because you have another choice. I'm going to listen to God today. I'm going to do what he wants now. And it'll change your life. You can be in God's blessing in, in, in a short period of time, minutes, hours, you can go from being out of God's will to being in God's will. Now the consequences and all the rest, they, they continue, but they're changed when your relationship with God changes. And he reached out to his chosen people over and over. He showed incredible mercy. He reminded them often of their calling. He told them to be a light to the nations. He reminded them that their children's lives would be affected by what they did. And it's a sad story of back and forth, back and forth. And when you read the Old Testament, sometimes you just want to shake your head and think, why are you doing that again? How did it work the last seven times? Sometimes when you read what God said through the prophets, you think, what more could he have said? Sometimes when you see them heading for another disaster, you just want to grab them by the shoulders and say, how much do you want to suffer in life? 
And in the seasons when the Jewish people obeyed God, they did have tremendous blessings. The nation of Israel thrived under David and under Solomon. Uh, they had material blessings. They had military uh, victories. They had influence over other nations. They built this glorious city of Jerusalem and then a beautiful temple for the worship of God, a temple that should still be there today, that was meant to be there forever, but isn't. And they were a brilliant testimony of the blessing of God. Remember the Queen of Sheba came to see Solomon, and she just marveled over and over at everything. She just looked at his servants, how they were dressed, how they acted, said, this is different. And she said, God must love his people to give them a king like you. God must love this nation to bless it the way he does. And hopefully she went back to Sheba, wherever that is, and said, we need to do things God's way here. But then they wouldn't listen. And they wouldn't obey. And they looked at the road of rebellion and it still looked tempting. And so the story goes on. And here's how it, not it ends, but here's the point it came to when they finally had pushed God away and wouldn't listen. The Israelites had sinned against the Lord, their God, who had brought them out of Egypt. They worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them. The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord, their God, that were not right. They did wicked things that provoked the Lord to anger. They worshipped idols. They would not listen and were as stiff-necked as their fathers who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their fathers and the warnings he had given them. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God. They bowed down to the starry host. They worshipped Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. They burned them alive. They practiced divination, witchcraft, and sorcery, and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, provoking him to anger. They, they felt sophisticated when they sinned. They said, well, we're, we're free. We make our own decisions. We're smart. We know how to bring, make ourselves happy. They felt like they were uh, doing the, right, the, the thing that all the other nations did and that they could lift their heads with pride. But they weren't. They weren't wise. They weren't smart. They weren't blessed. And most of the kings that they had in Israel and Judah, most of them didn't listen to God, and the people followed their example. And they got farther and farther from them. Once the word of God had been neglected so long and so badly that some guys were working in the temple. They were cleaning and, and repairing, and they came on this dust-covered box, and they opened it. It was called an ark, and there were scrolls in there. And they took them out and began to read, and it was God's Word. It was the writings of Moses and, and others. And they began to read what God had said. They came upon passages like the one uh, we just looked at a few minutes ago. And they said, wow. And they took it to the leaders who should have been protecting and using those scrolls to teach the people. And those people began to read them. And they took them to the king. And they said, "Why? Wow, you need to see this. And the king said, we're in trouble. We haven't been doing any of this. And there was a great revival. The king's name was Josiah. And, and the people from the king on down changed. They repented. They asked God for forgiveness. They began to, to do the things that he had told them to do as a people. And uh, they got close to God again. <clears throat> but just one generation later, they went back down the tube and were never more than a, a little ways from defeat because our choices matter and our children's choices matter. And it's the same today, isn't it? It's easy to follow our own desires. It's easy to make excuses. It's easy to shake off God's reminders and warnings. And he says, if only they would listen. If only they would listen. He wants to bless us. Through it all, God stayed faithful to his promises. He stayed dedicated to his people. He offered them loving guidance that they needed. Their unfaithfulness put them on a different path than he planned for them. 
but it didn't change his heart. He loved him. You can be God's child and be a problem child. Okay? And most of us take a turn doing that, don't we? But there, you're still his child when you come to know him. And they forfeited blessings that they should have had. And they faced consequences they never should have had. And he sent prophets to warn them. But they wouldn't listen. Sometimes they not only rejected, they attacked the messengers. Here's what it says. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place, the temple. But they mocked God's messengers. They despised his words. They scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. No remedy. Don't you hate it when there's no remedy? When the pain is strong, but there's nothing that will take it away? When the problem is severe, but you don't know how to fix it? When you just don't know how to make it better? It can happen in our spirit. It can happen in our walk with God. When he judges us, there's nobody else to turn to. There's nobody to overrule him. And it continues today. Listen to this scripture and ask yourself, does that sound like the place I live, the country I live in? It says, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, Brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine, sound teaching. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Any of that happening in our generation? Any of it happening in Austin? Any of it happening in your house? <laughs> or mine? America's in the same mess that the people of Israel were in. We just sometimes can't make up our minds whether we're really going to follow God or not. And as individuals, we make our choice. And our choice will decide our future and our destiny. And we're in danger of becoming stuck in our sins and deceived by the excuses we make if we really don't turn to God. It can happen in any generation. It can happen to any person. It can happen at any time in your life. Be careful to make your choices wisely. There may be someone here today that I don't know about, but God did, and he knew you needed to know about choices because maybe you're facing one right now that could determine your future, perhaps even your eternal destiny. Let's listen to God. Well, Israel reached a, a point of no return when they refused to listen to the last prophet that God sent them before their destruction, Jeremiah. He pleaded with them. He told them that by then, their only option was to surrender to the king of Babylon. He had camped all around their city. He was ready to break down the walls and take over. But they wouldn't listen. <clears throat> they wouldn't respond. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because he just cried and cried when no one would listen. Today, on the Jewish calendar, is a Tisha B'Av. And it's a, a certain day of the year. And today's the day, if you're Hebrew. And on that day, uh, they read the Book of Lamentations. When you read the Bible, there's the book of Jeremiah, which tells about his prophecies, and then there's the book of Lamentations, which he wrote right after Jerusalem was destroyed. And lamentation is just a broken heart. It's, it's sobbing and weeping from uh, brokenness. And Jeremiah wrote this as he saw the city that he loved destroyed, the people that he loved massacred, the people that he had pleaded with uh, struck down. On the, on the, the reason that this day matters 
in the Jewish calendar is a lot of things happened. The day that temple was destroyed by the Babylonians was on this day in history. And the day that the Romans destroyed the temple 500 years later was on this day in history. There were other tragedies that came. There was uh, this day in 1492, the Jews were forced to leave Spain. Remember 1492, somebody sailed the ocean blue? It's interesting that that ties in to the fact that the king had ordered every Jew out of the nation. The same thing happened to England on this day another year. This is the day Germany entered World War I and began a sequence of events that led to the rise of Hitler and the Holocaust. And so there's a, there's a whole list of things in Jewish history that this is a day to just say, God, help us. Help us. Have mercy on us. Well, the Babylonian army did break in. They did burn the temple. You see, the people had this myth. They got the idea, this is the temple of the Lord. There's never been another temple. This is it. It's, it's built to last. It'll always be here. God will never allow anything to happen to his temple. And so we're safe. No matter how we treat God, as long as we've got the temple right here, we're in a safe zone. And God told him, and he told him in so many words, that's not true. There is no safe zone for rebellion. And he allowed, he would rather not have a temple than to have it misused, to have it abused, to have it blasphemed, to have people think of it as a, as a magical thing. And so he allowed the Babylonians to come. They destroyed a multi-billion dollar beautiful temple that Solomon had built. He, they massacred most of the people. They destroyed their homes, the palaces. They took their food. Those they didn't kill, they took away. They took anything that they thought had value and dragged it along with them to Babylon. They took anyone that they thought maybe be useful and they dragged them along to Babylon. And the ones who were left were a remnant. You ever seen a remnant? It's just a little bit that's left. And they, they were left and they said, well, take care of the vineyards and plant some fields and we'll come back and take a share of the harvest. The country was destroyed. It lay in ruins. The people, it was a disaster. And then over the years, some of them came back. After 70 years in Babylon, the, there was a new king who said, you can go back if you want to. I'll even give you money to rebuild the temple. And so they went back and they began to rebuild their nation. Now, it was a lot smaller than it used to be. It was pretty much a shabby uh, thing compared to what they'd had. But at least it was their country. But it never had the freedom and the robust nature that they'd had before. They were always dominated by enemies. And Jesus came along about 500 years after Babylon. And he said, I will show you how to follow my God. In fact, over and over he would go to people and say, follow me, follow me. Follow me. And some did. And some wouldn't. And so again, the Romans were in charge by then. They destroyed the city as the Babylonians had. They repeated the devastation, the death, the destruction. And they tried to make sure Israel would never recover. They were so angry at these rebellious people. They, they tore down the temple and they, they lit it on fire and then they saw that there had been gold in there that melted in the fire and ran down in the cracks in the rocks. And so when Jesus said not one stone will be left on another, that's why they, they took crowbars and they, they pushed those stones and they toppled them off the Temple Mount so they could get at that gold that had melted and run down. They devastated that city. They massacred the people. They crucified thousands of them and they left it in a shambles. And they changed the name of the country from Israel to Palestine. Have you heard that? That was the Romans. And they, they took the, where the temple had been and put up a temple to their god Jupiter. And they even told the Jews, if we catch you in Jerusalem, we'll kill you. And so the Jewish people were scattered. This was uh, 
some of this happened in 70 AD, and then about 100 years later, there was a little flat flare up, and that, that was it. And the Jews were, were sent to live all over. Some went back to Babylon, some were in Egypt, some went over to Rome, and, 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 and they ended up all across Europe and, and in, into Asia and down into Africa. There's a whole group in Ethiopia who, who started living there after that. And there's, of course, they ended up in the Americas. And so the Jewish people were scattered, they were destroyed. And the Jewish, and the, the goal of the Romans was they'll never come back. This is it. It's not what God said was going to happen. And we're going to talk about that. We're telling a pretty sad story today, and it's a lousy place to stop, but we have to. But we're going to bring it up in two weeks. Next week, we'll talk about marriage. It's going to be fun. But, um, and it'll be for everybody. But uh, two weeks from now, I'll tell you how Mark Twain fulfilled a Bible prophecy. You know, Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, Innocence Abroad. He wrote a book about his travels to Israel. And he did something that God said would happen way back in the time of Moses. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about the people coming back, how they've returned home, how their wasteland has been restored. Their country, not only did the people lose their country, the country lost its people, and the country became ruins. Trees were chopped down. Crops failed. It became desert. There was a time when one of their enemies, they were always dominated. All these 2,000 years, there's been somebody running Israel, and it wasn't the Israelis, it wasn't the Jewish people. They were there, some were there. The majority in Jerusalem were usually Jewish, but they were always dominated. And one of them made a law, we're going to tax you by how many trees are on your property. So what do you suppose people did? And it ruined the land. But we're going to talk about it being born again. How being resurrected. It's going to be uh, exciting because the Jews have returned home. They were far from their homeland, but they never were forgotten by God. And one of the things I just learned this week is the Jewish population didn't change that much over the years. You know, if you, if you took the population of Italians or Germans or something, you'd say, well, in 1600 there were this many, but in uh, 20, 2000 or, or whatever there were this many, well, the Jewish population didn't change that much because some of them just gave up. Some of them just said, we're just going to live like everybody else and we're going to just fit in. But there were those who kept the word, the Torah, the, the words of God, read them in their synagogue, taught them to their children. And there were, a, there were a remnant who continued to obey the best they knew, the words of God. And they would uh, celebrate the feasts that God gave them. And one of the things they often did, like at Passover, when they had finished their Passover meal, they would lift the cup and say to one another, next year in Jerusalem, we'll be back where we belong. We'll be back where our forefathers were. By now, they had no idea what Jerusalem looked like. They'd maybe seen a few pictures. They'd been gone, their family had been gone for 2,000 years from Israel. But they would say, next year, because they knew the promise of God. And you know what? There are people in Israel today who said next year in Jerusalem, and they're there. They're coming back. They're coming back. They're coming back. They're doing what God said. He's doing what he said. It's a beautiful thing. We reap what we sow. But here's the cool thing. You're going to reap what you sow. But every time you plant a seed, good or bad, God plants something with it. Remember Squanto and the fish? God puts something in with that seed. It's called grace. If you plant a bad seed, he plants mercy. If you plant a good seed, he plants grace. If you plant a good seed, it gets bigger than you ever thought it could. If you plant a bad seed, God gives you a way to deal with it because he still loves you. It'll grow. You'll have to eat it, but there'll be mercy with it. God always makes things better than we deserve. Whether you're good or bad, he makes it better than you deserve. Aren't you glad for that? I count on it. 
God has given us a fearsome power to determine our future and our destiny with the choices we make. So how about if we make good choices? How about if we make the right choices? How about if we agree with God? How about if we say, do what he says? How about if we have a healthy respect for him as the power in the universe? And how about if we have a realistic evaluation that says, I need him. And I'm going to count on him because he invites me to. How about it? I picked up a book. It's got wonderful photography in it, pictures, beautiful things. It tells the story of five or six people who live in Israel today. And one of them is a cowboy from America, from the West. He wanted to go there and start a cattle ranch in Israel and he's there now and he tells his story and there's others uh, that tell their story and I'm telling you about it because I've got it on a film come and see where Jesus lay I see Mary in the garden she met Jesus there that day he said go tell Can't hold on. 